So um, the one thing that if you follow the electronics industry, you can't say, you cannot say that it's boring, right? If all you have to do is take a look at the newspapers that have gone on in just the last 12 months, and when you see all the things that have changed here, you just realize right away that this is a very dynamic industry, and we are seeing a lot of change. We are seeing companies at the brink of extinction. We are seeing companies just skyrocket to be the most valuable companies on the planet. Um, we're seeing intellectual property take over in terms of its value and, and, and how deals are being constructed. We're seeing entirely new industries like tablets come out of nowhere and really just take off and start to impact a lot of business models. We're seeing traditional, very strong countries that you, know, you might as well say, in terms of the amount that they contributed to it, to the electronics industry, really be challenged for their overall leadership. And we continue to see mergers and integration on a scale that I think is going to just you know, increase, especially as we see the market values moving around. We're seeing deals now that um, a long time ago you wouldn't have thought of. You know? Why would a company that made its money taking the advertising revenue and bringing it to the internet all of a sudden decide to jump into, uh, uh, j jump into the device manufacturing? Smart grid. Why would a company that has been making so much product for so long jump in now and really go after the intellectual property around the software that supports that? Uh, Chinese companies taking on mature market leaders, uh, you know, uh, a Korean company um, figuring out what happens when we see, you know, a lot of the litigation that's going on, what can happen to your brand. So there's just a ton going on in the, in the uh, newspapers and in the industry that is very uh, exciting. But, but the question is, what does it all mean and what do we do with all of that moving forward? So I think you need to take a step back and you start to realize that you know, we've thought of ourselves in electronics, and you can sort the different companies down in a lot of different ways. This is the way that I like to look at it. We've got folks at the beginning who are you know, taking and creating silicon and components, hard drives, and turning you know, all those components into something, the electronic manufacturing services companies. We've got folks that automate the factory, right? And automate you know, the energy and utilities industry. We've got people that, that you know, put out all the network equipment. We've got folks like that here. We've got folks who take the back office and try to, have been trying for decades now to automate and get rid of paper in the back office. Some trying to keep paper going there. We're now seeing a lot of our uh, companies really reach into the spending that's going on in healthcare and take the electronics and really get those applied on, a, on an unbelievable scale into automating the world's medical, uh, you know, medical issues. And then, as always, consumer electronics, which kind of got us into this game, uh, where people have gone from you know, transistor radios all the way to who knows what we're going to listen to music, music on tomorrow. I guess we can listen to it on just about anything these days. But when you take a step back, that's the device side of it, right? That's the device side. What is it that those consumers or customers are actually getting out of the things that we're doing, right? So if you take a look in the semiconductor industry, they're really trying to reach forward and understand what those future markets are because none of this is possible unless we see innovation at the lowest possible level, right? Either it's innovation to make the, these kinds of products more capable, or it's innovation that is making them more cost effective. And then you move on and you realize that in power and automation equipment, the customers really want to see you know, productivity in their factories. They really want to see energy become a lot more stable and a lot more cost effective. In network equipment, we're really providing connectivity all over the planet and in a variety of formats, ever-changing you know, platforms. In office equipment, advancing work, make it getting rid of the back office, right? I mean, it's really changing quite a bit. And, and really, maybe even seeing the paperless office we've been talking about for so long. In healthcare, when we start talking about how much uh, of the healthcare dollar actually goes into administration as opposed to patient care, and what can electronics really do for that? What can you do with all that data that's coming back? Can you change the way that healthcare is delivered using electronic products and services? And then finally, 
you know, thinking about the way that consumer electronics changes our lifestyle. You know, if there's one thing that I think the industry has woken up to, it's that the consumer can find out very quickly what all of his friends are doing with consumer electronics and change on a dime in terms of the kinds of consumer electronics that they're going to keep. Now, we also fuel innovation in a lot of other industries, right? I like to kid my colleagues in the automotive industry and tell them that a car is nothing but electronics on wheels. That's all it is, right? And it is becoming, um, electronics now have more substantial cost in the bill of materials of a car than steel. Who's driven a car lately that didn't have, I mean, even the, um, I'll say the lower end model cars are having an unbelievable amount of electronics in them as well. The same thing with aerospace, same thing with you know, telecommunications. You just keep walking through. And electronics really drives innovation in a lot of those industries. The question that we all have to answer is, do the companies in those industries monetize all this innovation, or do the electronics companies monetize all of the innovation? And I don't think the answer is clear yet. We're seeing people jump in from different directions. We're seeing telecommunications companies starting to private label handsets. We're seeing uh, folks in uh, the automotive industry worry about you know, who's really going to collect when someone's being entertained in the car. Um, obviously, I use the example of Google reaching in now buying you know, Motorola on the handset side. So it's trying to leverage their skill in terms of bringing together all the data in the operating system and then using that to uh, create a platform around the mobile device. So there's a lot of change going on, but it's all possible because of a lot of the innovation that is going on in the electronics industry. As you look at the green on this chart, what you figure out is that um, the electronics industry really drives most of the patents that go on in the world. Um, if you look at the top companies in terms of generating patents, um, they are pretty much all electronics companies. And you could argue that even Microsoft, with some of the actions that they're doing, uh, like Google, are kind of moving into the electronics industry in a real way. Um, I did notice the announcements around the Google results, and I think uh, they're probably feeling what it feels like to go through and have a, a device manufacturer in your portfolio and what that can do to, uh, to what used to be uh, very, very fast-growing results. So as you look at the, um, the patents, these are very important in the electronics industry. They're a representation of the amount of innovation that is going on inside of all of our companies. But the value to the electronics industry is only when these patents can be put to use, either by a single company or by a collection of companies. And the dynamics that we're trying to deal with in the industry really take advantage of a lot of that intellectual property. The increase in interconnectivity and the explosion of data that is now coming back at every manufacturer based on that. Industry convergence, as we talked about, all of the different mergers and acquisitions going on, the number of competitors in any given space uh, shrinking and then expanding as new entrants come in, the effect of emerging markets on the industry. Here we are in Taipei. Um, I, can I, I base myself out of Shanghai right now. I can tell you that was not an accident. Um, you know, some of the fastest growing markets that IBM is participating in are here uh, and, and near here, a lot closer to here than they are to the mature markets in the US and in Europe. Um, and that is something that is going to continue to stimulate growth, but it's also going to challenge our business models. And we'll be talking about that. Paul Burdy will be talking about that tomorrow. Um, how do you take business models that may have been started in other parts of the world and get them to be globalized. And then for the first time, and I, so we've been saying this for a few years, the empowered customers. And we should say customers or consumers. They now know more and can compare more quickly our products and services in the electronics industry than they ever could before. And that leads to change at an unprecedented rate of who they're using and who they are loyal to and how that information is shared. So that interconnectivity, it really drives you know, something that we like to call the Internet of Things. So a trillion things connected to the Internet. And we think about connecting to the Internet with our tablet, our PC, our phone. 
What about when it becomes very common for all of these devices to be talking to one another? We've instructed them on what we'd like them to do, but really without a lot of human intervention. Very important in the business to business market, very interesting for the business to consumer market. You could probably think of a, bu a bunch of things that could go wrong in that, in, that, uh, in that scenario, but it's coming. And you're seeing a lot of people really drive this. A billion transistors, meaning that there's really nothing that's not possible in terms of for an individual consumer, an individual customer, the kinds of things that they would like to see their products and services contain. And 45% of consumers, and we could take this in the B2B market as well, really relying not on the salesperson for information, relying on their friends, relying on other people that are using these products. Those are the kinds of dynamics that we're seeing that interconnectivity really drives. So all of us, and IBM included in that, as a major B2B company in the electronics industry, we need to align ourselves and really change our business models and keep transforming those models to line up against three major themes. The first being creating innovative products and services. Um, you know, and that's really judged by the market. You know, I should probably talk about this chart backwards, shouldn't I? Why don't we start with providing differentiated, innovative customer experiences? So it's not about the device. It's not about the technology. It's about what the customer can do with it, right? Now we all know that there's a lot behind that and we've got to work our way back across the chart in order to have innovative products and services that match up with that. But if you ever start like we used to with the next chip or the next you know, uh, hard drive or the next you know, memory you know, advancement, that's not going to work for you anymore, right? This is all about that experience and that is what's going to pull things through the chain. And it is a chain. It is a value chain. Very few companies can do this all by themselves. Right? Even back when, uh, when IBM was in some different markets, we would take a look at the bills of material and 70, 80% of what we were shipping inside of a product had nothing to do with something that IBM had engineered. Right? Definitely we didn't manufacture a lot of it. And I know that's true for all of you. So the value chain on the manufacturing side has been there for a while. As we look at services and content-driven services in both the B2B and the B2C side, we're gonna see those value chains become even more important. And they're gonna reach outside the electronics industry. They're gonna reach into our customers industry. They're gonna reach into our suppliers industry. It's going to really be a very interesting time to try to stay ahead of that value chain. You know, connectedness, it's just not uh, a hobby anymore, is it, All right? You look at, uh, in the consumer world, on Facebook, 34 times per day, a U.S. person is consulting Facebook, right? Just amazing. And, and things being consulted for business purposes, for uh, friend purposes, who knows how you're gonna do your next deal. I mean, or if you lost the client's business card, how you're gonna track them down. It could be using one of these tools, right? Um, 700 billion minutes, 4 billion videos. These numbers are just staggering in terms of the impact that they are having on who? The end users of a lot of our devices. This is how they want to use them. What we do in terms of creating them has to match up with the way the consumers and customers want to do it. Now on the business side, you know, 59% of US employees are using a mobile device in, the in their daily business life, okay? And they're using it not to just do voice or not to just do text, they're running business applications on their smartphones, okay? That is volume that is shifting away from other ways of accessing that, right? Whether it be a desktop computer, a laptop computer, a tablet, right? And we're gonna see that mobile um, phenomena in this area really change the way that the business processes are designed. So, you know, we've got to think about how that's going to play out and what requirements this is really going to drive. A 20-fold increase, I talked about the Internet of Things, a 20-fold increase in machine-to-machine -machine device connections, 20-fold. Over 2.1 billion connections back and forth. Now, 
you know, you hear stories from a, you know, uh, things that didn't work in a factory, you know, I mean, for years, people have been trying to put automation in, and in certain industries, in certain segments, like semiconductor, we're very highly automated in a lot of these plants. But you start thinking about in industrial automation, what could this mean, okay? What could happen in terms of productivity? What could happen in terms of the cost of our products? What could we do with those savings in terms of driving additional value into the value chain? And LinkedIn, from a business perspective, over 2 million folks um, on LinkedIn, companies putting pages out there. I can't tell you, I, I have had clients track me down. I've tracked down clients on LinkedIn. Just, it's, it's just amazing what that's done. And so, you know, social and mobile will have to become part of what you're doing and part of your strategy. So as we move up the, uh, the curve here, we see that we've gone from what was primarily a, primarily a physical industry, do you have the plants, do you have the supply chain, to more of a digital era. Can, do you have the digital platform to actually reach your customer or your consumer directly? And can you handle the connected consumer or customer era? Do you have something that's different? It's not gonna be enough to say, mine connects to the internet too, right? Not enough. If we can really drive this, what we're going to need to do is make sure that we deliver on that idea of the differentiated experience. So electronic CEOs, um, we, we survey them every two years. We do it for a broad group of CEOs. We, do it for, we, we then take a look at the results by industry. Um, if you take a look at the three themes, empowering employees through values, engaging customers as individuals, and amplifying innovation with partnerships. What does all that mean? It means that relationships are now the largest source of sustained economic value for companies. Interesting. Human capital, the ability to have people who understand how to leverage all those relationships. And I don't mean the kind of handshake relationships only. Those are good. But the digital relationship that you're gonna have with your customers. And then finally, turning those two things, the relationship and the people that work in your company, turning that into product and service innovation. Okay. The three now most important things on the list. The others are still all important, but in terms of what CEOs think in electronics are gonna grow, those are the things. And they gave us a number of quotes about disruptive technology, embracing and accelerating change, keeping customers for life. These are all things that 10 years ago, electronic CEOs didn't talk about. And I still catch an occasional electronic CEO saying, I'm a product company. And we hope we can help them to realize that the industry might pass them by if that's really their view. So when you try to innovate, you know, first myth, it's about new products and services. It isn't. It is, but it isn't. It's about business model innovation that drives profitability. Too critical and proprietary to involve outsiders. We can't let anybody see what we're doing. Well, the honest answer is external collaboration provides a lot of strategic advantages. You have to obviously pick your partners wisely, but there is an awful lot of value and acceleration that can happen through collaboration. And then finally, um, it's the responsibility of the brand and product managers and R&D, absolutely not. It's part of the company culture to innovate and to listen to customers and to really understand what it is they would like from you. We put together this model and there's some white papers that you can get your hands on that really explore this, just like our CEO study. But the core model, C-O-R-E, very simple. Capture the data. Most companies don't even bother to capture all the business data that their customers and their products make available to them. It just falls on the floor and really doesn't go anywhere. Optimize your insights. Build an organization that really understands how to be data driven, how to really change things based on what they're learning from data, not based on gut feel. Revamp development. Change the way you develop new products to respond to the markets very, very quickly. And then enhance the experience. Focus on enhancing what your customer or the consumer is feeling about your product and your services when they're being used. That is the ultimate test. That is the moment of truth of all of this work. So you start to ask yourself some questions. You know, am I, if I'm not in a product business, what business am I really in? And 
how do I get this connection? Okay. I mean, I've got it, they're, they're out there, they want to connect, but how do I really connect with them and start to utilize this data? And if they don't want to pay a premium on my product anymore, how do I really figure out which services and how to monetize those services? And once I've got that figured out, what does my organization look like, right? You know, where do all the people sit? Who controls what we do next? How do we decide strategic things? And how do we differentiate? because other people are gonna come up with some of the same ideas. Now, I like this chart a bit. This is uh, from Ocean Tome, and when you take a look here, what you see is that on the bottom are physical, I'm sorry, intangible assets, and on the top are tangible assets. So the plants and facilities we used to have in 1975 were 83% of what a company was worth. The rest was probably the financial analyst view of future earnings, something like that, right? As you march across, you start to see that you can now only find 20% of a company's value in plant and equipment and things along those lines. So where is it all? Our hypothesis is that if you take a look at a lot of companies, it's in the intellectual property and other things that you might call softer assets. And this is going to be very critical for everyone to manage as we saw in those headlines earlier. Now, another way of kind of taking this is taking a look at this is, if you look at those intangible assets, what does it mean to the market capitalization of your company versus uh, what it would be based on a uh, book ratio? And what you see here is a degree of leverage, okay? Very important. So somebody like Apple that is still primarily making their money on products, but look at that. They've, still, they, they've been able to multiply price to the book ratio by a factor of five, that's really representative of the degree of leverage they've gotten, okay? But then also the degree to which they've started to inject services into their revenue. You look at General Electric and you start to see, well, wait a second, what's going on? Still very heavily into the physical assets and heavy manufacturing, and so their balance sheet starts to show it. You look at IBM where we've shifted our model to now 80% services or software. All right? And you see the leverage that you start to get to on that in terms of your overall market capitalization and so on. You start to walk down. And you see others in the same industry, um, HP as an example, trying to do it but not really getting the leverage. So figuring out how to run the organization and drive a profitable service model, know which businesses to be in, which businesses to get out of, are very critical as well. You can't just say, I'm going to go asset light and expect to be successful. Right? You really have to think through that whole ecosystem and how you're going to do it. But the market does reward those that are able to do this successfully. So as you think about if you're product intense right now and you'd like to get to be somewhere else, it's very valuable. I mean, you know, this chart clearly shows it. But the question really is how do you drive yourself into that direction? So you really need to think about it. What could you do if all the sensor data in all of these products was available. And we're gonna talk about big data a little, bit, a little bit later. And what could you do if we were able to drive computing power through the floor, pennies, right, for unlimited computing power with, with uh, uh, innovations like the cloud. Interesting, you know, but the cloud is not just a connectivity tool. I mean, what could you do differently in your supply chain to drive supply chain costs down? What could you do in design if you could diagnose these issues in seconds? And then what could you do if you could crowdsource a lot of your innovations? What could you do with a billion person workforce contributing feedback to you? Could you even handle it? So the question we leave you with is what else could you do? And the state and the hypothesis is the, the possibilities are endless, and we're gonna ask a lot of the speakers today to really drive through a lot of those possibilities. And what would IBM be these days without a reference to the Smarter Planet? So let's you know, use this forum here to talk about what it's gonna to take to build that Smarter Planet. Thank you. <laughs>